Hello and welcome. The underground comics of the late 60s and the early 70s are usually not given the recognition they deserve. These comics are easily dismissed due to their preoccupation with sex, drugs, violence, more sex, and, well, just about any taboo topic one can imagine. At a glance, some artists seem to revel in the levels of depravity they could imagine and then commit to paper. And, in some cases, this is quite possibly true. After all, these comics weren't burdened by censorship. The creators were free to express whatever they desired without needing to fear the restrictions of an editor or a publisher. The only censor was their own imagination and sense of taste. These underground comics were an actual artistic movement within the medium. Like most worthwhile movements, it was rooted in rebellion. On the surface, they appeared to revel in sex and drugs, but they were also about being anti-authoritarian and anti-establishment. It was undeniably inspired by the counterculture movement of the era, but, equally, the undergrounds were a response to the repressive nature of comic books in general. The movement demanded and epitomized total creative freedom for the talent involved. As one might expect, the results varied, depending on the talent of the creator. First of all, these were labeled underground comics for two specific reasons. For one, the shops that carried these titles generally didn't have them on display. They were held under the counter, away from the eyes of the police, who might be looking for an easy obscenity bust. Secondly, comics was spelled with an X to mimic the commonly used X rating for movies. This announced the material was explicit in nature and not intended for children. Historically speaking, the so-called Tijuana Bibles were the spiritual antecedent to the underground comics of the late 60s. These were crude, cheaply produced mini-comics that began appearing as early as the 1920s. They literally contained nothing more than pornographic scenes involving celebrities or well-known comic book characters like Flash Gordon, Blondie, or Popeye. In other words, Tijuana Bibles were naughty drawings with barely coherent artwork and nothing more than that. Quite honestly, the sexually explicit content is the only actual connection between Tijuana Bibles and underground comics. Certainly both were cheaply produced and had unusual distribution channels. But the undergrounds had artistic merit, whereas the Tijuana Bibles have an oddly chintzy appeal and little else. The easiest demarcation point for the beginning of the underground movement is probably the publication of Zap Comics by Robert Crumb in 1968. Although it should be noted, there was a lot of published material by a variety of artists that preceded that title. For example, God Knows by Jack Jackson in 1964. This is often considered the first underground comic, but its impact was negligible, if it had any whatsoever. It would be reprinted in 1969 when Jackson, Gilbert Shelton, and a few other friends established Ripoff Press. The aforementioned Shelton was also an early underground artist. He began Wonder Warthog in 1962, and these satirical superhero stories appeared in a variety of publications, most notably drag cartoons. Most of the underground comic book material before Zap Comics was published in counterculture magazines such as the LA Free Press, the East Village Other, and, in Canada, the Georgia Strait. For the most part, the circulation of these magazines were regional, so they had an influence overall, but they were disjointed pieces that had yet to coalesce into a proper movement. Another argument for Zap Comics No. 1 being the beginning point is it was printed in the standard comic book format. This likely motivated others to create and self-publish their own comic books, as opposed to submitting material to be featured in magazines. So, the publication of Zap Comics is a touchstone moment. It pulled in and inspired other underground artists, and the movement itself formed into a coherent whole. Originally, Robert Crumb had drawn two full issues of material that he submitted to a local independent publisher. Unfortunately, that publisher disappeared, taking the artwork for the first issue with him. Understandably frustrated at the loss of his artwork, Crumb decided to self-publish the material he had left over instead of trusting another person with it. Photocopies of these lost pages would be discovered a year later, while the third issue of Zap Comics was being produced. This material was subsequently published as Zap Comics No. 0, since it was artwork that preceded the actual publication of Zap. The exact number of copies produced for the first printing of Zap Comics No. 1 is unknown. Some sources recall it as being as low as 1,000 copies, while others contend it was closer to 5,000. 
Regardless, the bulk of the printing was bought by a distributor in San Francisco, who then sent the comic to counterculture stores throughout America. Following the publication of the first issue, Robert Crumb solicited work from other fellow artists. Zack then became a collective of like-minded individuals who inspired one another. The core group, who contributed to every issue thereafter, was Crumb, Rick Griffin, S. Clay Wilson, Spain, Gilbert Shelton, Victor Moscoso, and Robert Williams. All shared in the profits of the comic and retained the rights to the material they individually produced. Within a very short amount of time, other homegrown publishing companies emerged. Apex Novelties, the publishing company literally created to print Zap Comics No. 1, would be joined by Ripoff Press, Print Mint, and Last Gasp, all of whom worked out of the San Francisco area. At the same time, other notable creators, such as Kim Deitch, Trina Robbins, and Bill Griffiths, moved to the area and became involved with the underground comic scene. Amongst the underground artists, there was no brand loyalty, generally speaking, that is. Creators produced material for whatever publisher was soliciting work at that time. For the most part, this led to a wide variety of anthology titles, all with a loose theme. Most titles were one-shots or had a brief run of a few issues. Characters such as Mr. Natural and the Freak Brothers appeared in many different titles during this time. While these were recurring characters, their stories were always self-contained and there was nothing resembling continuity. Underground comics were not immune to criticism or, in some cases, legal action. Some artists seemed to revel in exploring the darkest scenarios they could imagine, which would have an inherent value if the point wasn't merely to shock the audience. Furthermore, it inspired others to produce similar material and then to claim it existed under the disguise of unrestricted creative expression. This undermined the artistic merit of underground comics in general. As Trina Robbins pointed out, the depiction of women in underground comics was misogynistic and degrading. Objectively speaking, this is a point that is hard to refute. For the most part, the women in these stories were objectified and used as props for sexual fantasies which seemed at odds with the counterculture movement and its inclusion of women's liberation and the sexual revolution. As if in response to having her criticisms dismissed by contemporary underground artists, Robbins would assemble a team of female creators and put together the first comic book completely created by women, It Ain't Me, Babe. The success of that title led to a collective of female creators getting together and regularly publishing women's comics. Famously, Zap Comics No. 4 included a Robert Crumb story titled Joe Blow. The story is, in a nutshell, all about incest. It's also a satire of the stereotypical 50s family, but that element is overshadowed by the graphic sex. Print Mint, the publisher of that issue, was subsequently charged with printing and distributing pornography. The case was later dismissed, and the charges were dropped. Crumb would also receive a fair amount of criticism for his recurring character, Angel Food McSpade. To state the obvious, she was a grotesque racial caricature. Essentially, her depiction was indefensible. Overall, despite the criticisms, there were titles that were essential to the growth of the medium. Zap Comics was a very good example of the undergrounds. It represented a diverse array of talent, and it was probably the most experimental of all the titles. It definitely pushed the boundaries of taste and acceptable creative expression. Bijou Funnies was another title that had a high degree of talent and a subversive, satirical streak. For an underground comic, the sexual misadventures and the drug references were at a minimum. Gothic Blimpworks, a comic book insert for the East Village Other, was practically a checklist of available talent working during this period, most notably Von Bodie and his most well-known creation, Cheech Wizard. Young Lust was a sexually explicit parody of romance comics. Bill Griffiths, the creator of Zippy the Pinhead, probably contributed the best stories to this anthology. Much like the counterculture movement of the 60s, once the social atmosphere changed, the undergrounds began to slowly taper off and disappear. Possibly ennui was a contributing factor, and disagreements between well-known creators was another. Like most movements, there were well-known figures that set the standard, and all others were marginalized, despite their contributions to the medium. This elitism slowly eroded the spirit that originally inspired others to create. However, there was one change that significantly contributed to the movement becoming background noise. In 1973, the slightly vague obscenity laws in America changed, 
Very briefly, the definition of obscene was left to be defined by localized community standards, rather than being regulated on a federal level. Basically, the free speech protection, which allowed these creators to produce the material they did, no longer existed. After mid-1973, all material was subject to what a community decided was or was not indecent. Unsurprisingly, this allowed law enforcement to raid and seize any material that didn't live up to these local standards. In other words, stalking or displaying material deemed obscene virtually guaranteed a shop would be raided, fined, and in many cases, closed down because they didn't adhere to community standards. One could suggest the underground comics were historically important for two distinct reasons. The first reason being, it was a genuine artistic movement, inspired by and incorporating the spirit of the era. It was intentionally subversive material. Secondly, it challenged the restrictions of what was possible in the medium in both writing and artwork. This, more than anything, was important for comic books. Undergrounds inspired those that followed to reject the narrow definition of what was possible and to create challenging material for a mature audience. Along the same lines, the material produced was controlled by the creators, not by the publisher. Furthermore, these comics required an entirely new distribution system. Eventually, as more comic book specialty stores appeared, it could be argued this distribution system indirectly inspired the early model of what is now known as the direct market. The spirit of underground comics is definitely felt in what would be known as alternative comics in the late 70s and 80s. Star Reach, ElfQuest, and Cerebus all feel unique and independent of the established comic book system. Perhaps the best example of this influence is Love and Rockets. This series seems perfectly situated between mainstream sensibilities and the spirit of the undergrounds. It's an anthology title that is difficult to categorize because it's a unique blend of both elements. Nowadays, the pioneering and challenging work of the undergrounds is nearly commonplace in the mainstream, especially among Image Comics and most titles from the now-defunct Vertigo Comics. Language, sexuality, and mature themes are regularly explored. There is some editorial or publisher censorship, but overall, in comparison to past decades, it is somewhat mild. This transition was a slow process, requiring many decades and degrees of change. But the undergrounds proved that comic books were capable of maturity if the creators were given an opportunity at honest, creative expression.